Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. Thank you for joining me for a continuation of our discussion about the Letitia Stout trial. And I do understand that at this point while I'm recording this, the trial is over. Um, as I had explained previously, I did need some time. I've been watching the trial, but I did need some time to kind of like sit down and talk about it just to parse through my emotions so that it didn't become unproductive, right? It didn't become just me sitting here raging at you guys for an hour and a half. I wanted to actually, you know, just ha have a little bit more of a friendlier tone in my in my voice and in my demeanor and just for myself like I didn't I don't want to you know I didn't want to drive angry <laughs> so that's why we are kind of a little slow on the updates but at this point we're going to sort of go through the rest of the witnesses I believe for the state and then the next video we're going to start talking about the defense case which I think is when um, that's when I'm going to truly be getting more and more angry. But whatever. It's fine. We've got to talk about it. We've got to go through it. Gannon deserves this. And Letitia deserves to get, you know, verbally ripped apart. And on that note, I think that um, it's, it's just something to start off the video with a little lightheartedness. Remember, I said that uh, Letitia Stauk is who Casey Anthony wanted to be when she grew up. And remember that Casey Anthony... In the midst of all her lies and in the midst of her multiple changing stories, she would always start talking about specific people that she knew that uh, Kaylee was with or that she was hanging out with with Kaylee and people she worked at Universal Studios with, you know, things like that when she wasn't actually working at Universal Studios any longer. And one of those people was uh, called Juliet Lewis. And we always made fun of Casey Anthony because she had made one of her fake people have the name of a real person, but not just a real person, a, a real famous person who you know, kind of everybody knows about. Like, you guys know about Juliette Lewis, right? If you don't know about Juliette Lewis, it's probably because you're very young. But here's somebody you might know about, somebody that Letitia used, not for the name of a random person in one of her random stories, but a name for herself. One of her aliases, one of her on-record aliases was Taylor Swift. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even. So Letitia wants to be like a Kardashian. She wants to live a life like a Kardashian. She wants to spend money like a Kardashian. And as you'll hear from this video or in this video, she also believes she's a fashionista of sorts. But Letitia not only wants to live and be like a Kardashian, but she considers herself to be Taylor Swift. Maybe that is one of her personalities. Maybe Taylor Swift is one of Letitia's alleged personalities. Wow, that it just it blows my mind. I did kind of post some things on social media, I think Instagram this past week as I was watching the trial, and just my disgust at the display of Letitia and her lawyers chatting with each other and laughing with each other as the testimony is going on. It's absolutely disgusting. I understand that these lawyers have to represent her. I understand that she deserves this representation and she deserves her day in court. I understand that people feel that way, at least. I don't think she deserves her day in court, but I understand that people feel that way, and I understand that we have to give everybody the same treatment in this country in order for this country to, you know, have a working justice system. What I don't understand is why these attorneys think it's appropriate or or why they think it looks good for anybody sitting at that table for them to all be, like, whispering into each other's ears and sharing each other's drinks and laughing it up, sitting at that defense table while there's people up on the stand testifying about an 11-year-old boy who was murdered, <laughs> right? I just, I don't understand. Because to me, I'm there to do a job, right? I'm going to be professional. I'm going to uh, defend you to the best of my abilities, but I don't like you. I don't have to like you. And that means I don't have to like get all cuddled up next to you and let you whisper in my ear and giggle about it. So I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what Taylor Swift, I mean, Letitia, has done to her attorneys to get them to be like little cuddly puppies around her. But it's disgusting. I'm disgusted. And before before I get much more into everything, let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, and then we'll dive in and we'll talk about day three and day four of Letitia's trial. And our sponsor today is Surfshark VPN. 
I think the internet can be a fun and wonderful place. There's so much to discover, so much to learn. Obviously, it's benefited, you know, society and humanity in multiple different ways. However, it can also be a place full of dangers and unfair restrictions and plenty of trickery. Human beings need to feel safe and comfortable in order to flourish. And luckily, Surfshark VPN exists to help keep you protected on the internet so you can enjoy all that the World Wide Web has to offer with an unburdened mind and an open heart. Surfshark VPN secures your data with industry-leading measures by using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. And Surfshark also provides IP and DNS leak protection so that nobody can figure out where you're connecting from. I also love that unlike my internet service provider, Surfshark VPN has a strict no-logs policy. They aren't watching or recording what I'm doing on the internet because I am a grown-ass woman. I'm an adult and it's none of their business. So what can you do better on the internet with Surfshark VPN? A lot, okay? You can overcome location price-based discrimination on travel expenses like plane tickets and rental cars. If you're traveling internationally, you can log into a server in your home country so your bank account doesn't lock you out or freeze your account for security purposes, which does happen all the time. And it is very, uh, first of all, annoying and stressful to be stranded in a different country in a foreign land without access to your money. You can also feel more safe on public Wi-Fi, which is a sentence that I I really never thought I would say because I know how dangerous being on a public Wi-Fi is. You could be a college student and know how to hack into somebody's device through a public Wi-Fi connection. But Surfshark encrypts your data and it makes it impossible to steal and you can easily and quickly get around censorship and geo-blocking. So all the information you want is available, not just the information that the powers that be want you to see. On top of all of those things, which are practical applications for your life, you also have some fun things that you can do with Surfshark VPN. You can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the US and Japan, simply by connecting to a server in that country. And at this time, Surfshark has reached the coverage of 100 countries, and they are the only VPN to do so at this point, which is pretty great. Surfshark also has an app for every platform, PC, Mac, uh, Linux, Android, iOS, smart TVs, Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, PlayStation. I could go on and on, but the best part is one subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on all of those devices, on an unlimited number of devices at once. Like, it's it's amazing that not only could you protect your phone, your tablet, your Xbox, um, your computer, you can also protect your family's devices, your kids' tablets, your kids' PS5s and Xbox and all that stuff, your mom's computer. There is truly so much value in Surfshark VPN, and they think that you will agree that there's a lot of value there, to the point where they're willing to give you a 30-day money back guarantee if you don't think that Surfshark is absolutely amazing for you and your life and your internet needs. And this gives you plenty of time to try it out risk-free and see how you can apply it to all different places in your life. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow, use code Stephanie Harlow, and you'll get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month. That's amazing. It's literally less than a cup of coffee. It's less than a bad cup of coffee, okay? Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year subscription plus three extra months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Okay, we are back. So day three of Letitia's trial started with more phone calls between herself and her husband, Al Stauk. And I'm not going to go over each phone call minute by minute. I'm just going to sort of condense, you know, these phone calls into a summary of important and relevant points. And since so many of those important points are repetitive, I'm not going to just refer to every instance where those points are relevant, right? I don't need to talk about every single phone call. I don't need to talk about every single thing that Letitia said to Al Stauk. I honestly wish I could. I wish I could spend an entire video breaking down and breaking apart every single thing she said and then talking about what a terrible person she is, reminding everybody what was happening at the point when she was saying those things, which is the fact that Gannon had been missing, his body hadn't been found yet, his father was desperately trying to 
you know, have some sort of evidence or some sort of lead as to where Gannon was. And Letitia is attempting to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. And she's just constantly going on and on and on, making up different stories, making herself the victim. It's disgusting. But something that is relevant about all of the phone calls is that throughout every single one of these phone calls, Letitia never changed her personality. She never called herself by a different name. She never changed her voice, her pitch of her voice, the inflection of her voice. She didn't break into her own rendition of Teardrops on My Guitar. She consistently called herself Letitia, responded to Letitia, and acted like Letitia. She was just normal, old Dr. T. Stauk during every call, and there are a lot of calls, and these calls are long. So I guess that her other personalities, maybe they just didn't like talking on the phone. Now, in the first call that's played on day three, we find out that Letitia has not told Al where she's been staying, because at this point, she's left the house. Uh, Al's ex-wife and Gannon's mother, Landon, has come into town to look for Gannon, and Letitia has basically kind of been kicked out of the house, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that, yeah, Elle doesn't really trust what she's saying, and he doesn't buy her story, and he feels she knows something that she's not saying. But Letitia also won't tell Elle where she's been living or what they've been doing, and she claims this is because she's feeling that Elle's not on her side, and she said she knows that he's talking crap about her, like behind her back. And even if Letitia wasn't the one who was responsible for Gannon's disappearance and death, this type of behavior would still make me feel like she was one of the worst people I've ever met. She's being so emotionally manipulative towards Al. She's putting the responsibility for every negative feeling that she has on Al, and she's doing this while his son has been missing for over a month. What kind of person makes everything about them and spends hours sobbing and whining on the phone to a man who literally has better things to do? Literally has better things to do. Like, find out where his son is. Like, trying to locate Gannon and worrying every single minute that something bad happened to Gannon or is currently happening to Gannon. What kind of person does that? It shows either an incredible lack of self-awareness or an incredible amount of narcissism or both. But either way, like, keep in mind, she knows. She knows that she's the one who's responsible for this position she's put her husband in and herself in. And she's constantly trying to make him feel bad that he doesn't believe her, that he isn't defending her, and that he's not on her side. And I think there was a big part of Letitia that knew the only reason Al was still talking to her was because he felt she held the key to finding out where Gannon was. And she was also using this, using this to stay in contact with him, to keep talking to him. Now, during this call, which reportedly took place on February 14th, Al wishes Letitia happy Valentine's Day. And then she proceeds to complain that he has abandoned her and how she and her daughter Harley are in a bad position because they don't have money and Al kicked her off the car insurance and she wants to know if he's filed for a divorce yet. And Al basically is like, what are you talking about? You don't have money. You took like $1,400 out of the bank account. I didn't say anything about that. I've always given you everything you want. I would never have you guys like on the streets. And I didn't kick you off my car insurance. Like something happened with the car insurance and we all got kicked off. And honestly, like I kind of think maybe you had something to do with it because you're the only other person who knows all the passwords and knows how to get into this account. And as far as like filing for divorce, no. I haven't filed yet. Al basically tells Letitia that he feels she doesn't have trust or respect for him, so he feels that it's very difficult for him to show her trust and respect, which is absolutely true, right? That's completely understandable to a normal person, not like Letitia. Letitia doesn't understand. She doesn't understand that you have to give things to get them back, that you have to give love, kindness, and respect to get that in return. And Al said to her, listen, I just want you to tell me the truth because I know you haven't told me the truth. Al said he had been looking into things and investigating things himself and kind of going over her stories and nothing was adding up. So he would like for her to show him respect and trust by telling him the truth. Al is like, listen, you're giving me a million different stories and you have three more stories every time I talk to you. And finally, Letitia starts talking about immunity. She's like, well, I would tell you the truth if I was sure that I could get immunity. 
Because, yeah, that's exactly what an innocent person asks for, immunity. A, an innocent person who truly only cares about this 11-year-old boy coming home safe, or at least who truly cares about his family members and his loved ones having some closure about where he is so that they can stop stressing themselves and worrying themselves to death. A normal person like that would completely just be interested in getting immunity before they gave any information that might bring this kid home safe or bring this kid home in general. It hurt me to ask it because you're my wife. And, you know, I first thing I started with today was happy Valentine's Day. That should tell you how I feel about you. OK, but I need you to be here with me to it. I am. I'm right. I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm begging you. If they give me immunity, I will help. Okay, but I, so here's. I can't get in trouble, boy. Okay. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm trying to under. I have always said, if during an argument, a person breaks down into like shrieking tears and just starts like screaming and yelling and crying and making themselves a victim, it's because they probably have no argument. And the more high-pitched the shrieking cries are, the less of an argument they have. Case in point, Letitia Stauk, during every conversation with Al, she does this the moment her back is to a wall. And I think that she's doing it to either elicit sympathy or to buy herself time to come up with something that she might be able to make work, right? We hear this, and this is the benefit of listening to all these calls because I'm not playing all the calls for you. And I'm not even telling you you should listen to all the calls if you want to know more about the way the mind of an insane person works. <laughs> not a clinically insane person, just an insane person, a banana Sunday with nuts like Letitia. If you want to understand that better, then I do think that listening to all those phone calls would be super valuable. But that is the benefit of listening to all those phone calls and listening to her interviews with police and listening to her interview, the one interview she did, the weird one where she she had her back to the camera and she was like, I just want him to come home so I can show everybody they were wrong about me. Any message for Gannon? The message for Gannon I have is, Gannon, when you get here, you'll be able to truly tell what happened. And then I really hope I get a sincere apology from everyone who has made all those things, especially from my husband. And again, I can't wait till you can come home and let everyone know that you're okay. That weird, awkward interview that made her look more guilty, from listening to all of these things, from listening to the way she interacts with people and the things she does, I can pick up patterns in her behavior. I can see her defense mechanisms. Basically, I've you know, decoded her poker face, in my opinion. And this is exactly what she does every time. When she's asked a question she can't answer, when she's asked a question that she doesn't really know how to answer, or when she's basically uh, faced with facts or evidence that make her look bad or make her multiple stories less plausible, she just gets like super like screechy, high pitched. Oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this to me. Like I did a beauty. Uh, uh, uh. Now there are several phone calls that take place between Elle and Letitia on February 14th. And during these calls, Letitia basically goes over all the, the different versions of her stories that we've all become familiar with through news reports, through the affidavit, um, the arrest affidavit, things like that. You know, her first story was that her and Gannon had come home and there was somebody in the house, Eduardo, I think, and he was waiting for them, even though there's motion detectors in the house and the motion detectors showed no sign of movement while Gannon and Letitia were at Petco. So there was definitely nobody in the house, but she said that there was as she went in with Gannon and this guy, Aguardo, assaulted her and then wrapped Gannon in a blanket and took him away. And then there was another story she told where um, Gannon was riding his bike and she was watching him and then some guy ran up and took Gannon as he was riding his bike. And then there's another story she told where her and Gannon were in the car driving and then somebody was like in the middle of the road so that they would stop and then this guy got in the car, et cetera, et cetera. Like, okay, do you remember she said she's driving? In the car with Gannon, someone was lying in the road, and this person, a man with a gun, he got in the car with them, because that makes sense. You just stop, because there's a guy in the road, and be like, yes, please, sir, get in. You wouldn't back up. You wouldn't go around him. When he moved out of the way to get in your car, you wouldn't speed off. You wouldn't lock your doors, which is something Al brought up. He's like, I don't understand why you wouldn't just lock your doors. The car you were driving, the vehicle you were driving, those doors lock automatically. Nobody would be able to get in. It doesn't make any sense. This is what she said. The guy got in. 
and rode all the way back to their house with her and Gannon. And Gannon was in the back seat when this happened, and he was so stressed out. He was crying and scared, and he was so upset he threw up. Okay, that's what she told Al in one of these February 14th calls. This is like one of the multiple stories she's telling. And as a personal aside, I will say these calls were extremely difficult to get through, hard to listen to, especially considering how many of them there were and and the length of them. For me, the constant manipulation and gaslighting coming from Letitia was incredibly emotionally, mentally exhausting to listen to because I've been on the other end of that. I've been somebody who had to listen to somebody like Letitia and and cared about somebody like Letitia and constantly felt like, am I doing something wrong? Because I love this person and I, I think they're a good person. I know they're a good person, but they're constantly saying like everything's my fault and they're saying things that don't make sense. And then when I you know, remark on the fact that they don't make sense, they're yelling at me and they're mad at me and they act like I've hurt them in some way. And this is very, very um, difficult to to deal with. And it's hard to hear somebody do that to somebody else for hours on end. I will say that's the one thing about listening to those phone calls that that was a very big drawback because I did have to take breaks and it was just very emotionally draining to listen to for that long. Letitia's intentionally confusing when recounting all of these different stories and timelines. And then when Al will cut in sometimes to clarify because he's like, wait, wait, now you're saying this? Because before you said this, he's just trying to figure it out, right? He's trying to have a concrete timeline. He's trying to have a concrete idea of what happened that day. But when she tells three different versions, he has to clarify and make sure which version is the actual one, you know. Or sometimes he would even just speak out loud what she already said to confirm. She would say like, oh, we were driving on this road. And he'd be like, oh, you're driving on this road. And she'd get so mad. So as soon as he would cut in to clarify or to just like confirm, she would respond to him with like, no, or that's not what I said. No, this is what happened. And it's just the way she says it. You know, she says it in a a very condescending way. Like, what are you, stupid, Al? Are you not listening? How hard is this to comprehend or absorb? Good Lord, this man is dumb. Like, that's the tone of her voice. That's how she's trying to make him feel. She wants him to feel stupid. She wants him to feel like this is his fault. It's his brain that's not working. She's telling him everything. She's telling him everything that happened in a very clear and concise way. And he's the one that just can't figure it out. He can't put it together. And now she's got to repeat herself because he just hasn't grasped it yet. Ugh, stupid man. Something about you at Petco and then you got you got in the truck and there was the guy was there or something? No. I asked him to go get that. See what I mean? The way she's like, no, like this is what happened. And then she's like cutting out. And honestly, she cuts out a lot in these phone conversations. Um, I think that it's a purposeful thing. Like I think she's like taking maybe her shirt and rubbing it on the mic of her phone to intentionally make what she's saying undecipherable or indecipherable, right? I think that honestly, she's got to be doing something purposely because I've never heard a phone call between myself or anybody That's had that many disruptions to the point where like somebody's talking completely clearly and then all of a sudden there's like two sentences that you just cannot hear at all. And I can tell. I can tell that Letitia has been verbally and emotionally abusive towards Al throughout the relationship. She's been manipulative throughout the relationship because they both seem way too comfortable and familiar with this dynamic. And you could say, oh, no, Al is just acting this way in order to get more information from her because if he was like – mad or combative, she would shut down. And I agree with you to an extent, but I also don't think that he was behaving on these phone calls completely opposite from how he would normally act because then she would pick up on something. So I do think a lot of the time in his conversations and his interactions with Letitia, Al would just sort of pull back. You know, At at some point, he'd become so mentally exhausted from the cartwheels that she was putting him through that he'd just be like, okay, man, whatever you say, like, (laughs) whatever. And it seems like, once again, they both are used to this dynamic. They both fell into these roles very easily. And it was just incredibly tough to sit through for me. I felt very bad for Al. For instance, during one of Letitia's long, rambling, and convoluted explanations, Al repeats what she said. And he he immediately follows it with, like, I'm not trying to be smart or anything. And before he can even get that statement out... Letitia hits the wall and starts shrieking simply because she thought he was questioning her or doubting her, when in reality, he was bending over backwards to let her know that that's exactly not what he was doing. He was just trying to get everything straight in his head. And he's doing this because he clearly knows from experience how she reacts when she's being questioned 
or criticized, right? So, I mean, I'll try to give an example of what I mean. I don't know if I clipped it, but she said something and he's like, oh, okay, so this is what happened. He's like, and I'm not trying to be like a smart ass or anything. And she's like, she lost it, right? What he's trying to do, and I've done this, what Al did, I've done this in in specific conversations with specific people because I know how they react to criticism or just anything that could be perceived as criticism, even if you're not criticizing. So you have to immediately, as the person who's dealing with someone like Letitia, you have to immediately like let them know, oh, by the way, I'm not questioning you. I'm not mad at you. I don't not believe you. But, you know, I'm just trying to you have to do that. And it's horrible. And a lot of this comes from childhood trauma, from being a people pleaser, from fawning. You know, if you're aware of the term fawning, a lot of this comes from just trying so hard to make sure the other person is never in a negative state of mind, because you know that when that person's in a negative state of mind or mad about something, your life's harder. So you do everything to make that person's life easier so that your life is easier by default. And that's exactly what's happening. And if anyone watching this right now has a desire to learn more about Letitia Stauk or about sociopaths in general, like I'm not saying she's a sociopath and being a little hyperbolic and being like a little petty, but she ain't right, okay? So if you want to learn more about Letitia Stauk, her thought process, her manipulation tactics, I do suggest listening to the calls in their entirety um, throughout the trial. During the calls that were being played for the jury, Al Stauk would periodically be called back to the stand so that the state or the defense could question him. And during these times, we got a little bit more background information and some insight into how Al and Letitia's relationship started. You know that they had started dating in 2014 while Al was going through a divorce with Gannon and Lena's mother, Landon. Landon and Al had physically separated, like they weren't living together anymore, but they were in this one-year waiting period that apparently South Carolina required requires before a divorce can be finalized. And at this point, they were sort of switching off every other week uh, of custody with the kids. So one week, Al would be living in their family home with the kids. And then the next week, he would leave and go like whatever to an apartment or whatever. And then Landon would come in and stay one week with the kids. But after he moved out permanently, the kids remained with Landon. And she sort of had like working full custody. And then Al would have them every Wednesday night and every other weekend. Al and Letitia met on a softball team that they both played on. And apparently they'd met before they started a relationship. They kind of knew each other through softball. But then when things were rocky with Landon and Al, Al and Letitia started a relationship. And they were having fun together. And I guess their connection was intense because they moved very quickly. They were married by January of 2015. So understand, this dude's not even like physically or legally divorced yet. He meets Letitia. I don't know what she did to him. But then within a year, they were married. I mean, less than a year, right? Because if they started dating in 2014 and they got married in January of 2015, unless they started dating in January of 2014, which is unlikely, definitely less than a year. And that's a that's a lesson for everyone to learn, okay? Don't get married unless you absolutely know somebody as much as you possibly can. And don't get married if you haven't been dating each other for you know, more than a year because it's impossible to know somebody thoroughly in that amount of time, especially when they're Letitia and they try to hide everything about their true selves from everyone. So when Al and Letitia were married and living together, it was then Al decided to try and get full custody of Gannon and Lena because he had some concerns about Landon's living situation at the time. She was living with her boyfriend, who's now her husband, Mike Hyatt, but they were just dating at that time. And uh, Al said he was concerned about criminal activity and drug use going on at the home where his children were staying. So he was able to get custody of his children, Gannon and Lena, and that's kind of when they were thrust into Letitia's life a little bit more heavily than they had before. We also had Letitia's defense team asking Al about his knowledge of Letitia's mental health issues. One of her lawyers said, listen, is it true that Letitia had a hard time keeping a job because of her mental health issues? And Al was like, yeah, but not because she did things that made her seem unstable or unable to do her job, just because she intentionally left her job. Like she never felt like she was getting enough respect in her positions. And the lawyer asked if Al knew that Letitia had been having mental issues and seeing a doctor or a therapist in the fall of 2019. And Al responded like, yeah, I knew that she had gone to see someone, but I only knew of one occasion during which Letitia had seen a mental health professional 
And Al said he'd gone with her to that appointment and he waited for her in the lobby. And outside of that, he had no idea that she was seeing anybody else. Now, reportedly, Letitia had also been prescribed lorazepam for anxiety. And according to her attorney, Letitia's doctor had advised Letitia to quit her job because her mental health issues were so severe. And you indicated that you don't you don't think that she had any mental health issues? Mental health issues. No, I did indicate that I don't think she had any okay. mental health issues. Um, do you remember at that point in time um, telling Detective Riley, I hope that it doesn't come to that, but if you put her daughter on the hot seat, she'll say, I love my mom. You know, I would do any, I wouldn't do anything without my mom, but she's freaking nuts, you know, crazy. So that was drawn. I, I remember saying that or something to that point. Okay. Yeah. So you told the detective that she's crazy. Mr. Tulaney, would you quote what you just quoted to me? Or that, or you told the detective that Harley would say that her mom is freaking nuts, crazy. That's what I said. Okay. No further questions. No further questions. No further questions. Okay. <laughs> no further questions. Like, he really thought he did something there. Like, he dropped a bomb on the court. Stop the trial. This woman is clearly not guilty by reason of mental insanity because her teenage daughter called her nuts. I mean, what? It's beyond a reach. Did you tell the detective that Letitia's daughter said she was nuts? And, and, do you know how many of my kids would say I was nuts? Three. Do you know how many kids I have? Three. Do you know how many times I said my mom is nuts? Too many to count, okay? It doesn't mean that I think she's clinically insane enough to murder an 11-year-old boy because she's hearing voices in her head. OK, it doesn't mean that I think my mother is like, you know, has multiple personalities and she's out here like acting a fool in the streets. It just means like my mom and I have arguments and I'm like, she's nuts, you know, or I'll do something that my kids think is weird and they'll be like, she's nuts. This is ridiculous. The fact that Dr. T's lawyers are trotting this stupid little anecdote out shows us exactly how weak her case is. OK, it's so ridiculous. I can't even believe that they even brought it up like every single teenage kid has never said that about every single one of their parents. <laughs> Ludicrous. And I would like to also say being diagnosed with lorazepam, which is an, an, it's an anxiety medication or it helps with sleep. It can be a sleep aid too. That does not mean that you have disassociative identity disorder. It means you have anxiety. And people who have anxiety suffer with that but having anxiety does not make you brutally murder an 11-year-old boy, okay? So where are they going with it? Were you aware that Letitia was prescribed anxiety medication? Yeah, and? And who cares? I feel like I feel like at least 8 out of 10 people in the United States right now has some sort of like anxiety or antidepressant medicine. I just I think that's I think that's the case. So I don't understand why it's being used in this trial. But anyways, the prosecution, the state follows up and um, the state's attorney, he says to uh, Al on the stand, he's like, hey, Letitia was good at softball, right? She played a lot. You know, did she know how to follow the rules of softball? And Al responded, yes, she did. Not only did she know how to follow the rules of softball, but she was able to teach those rules to others, right? And Al said he absolutely believed Letitia always knew the difference between right and wrong, even right before Gannon's murder. And that is the crux of this issue, okay? It's not about whether Letitia had mental health issues. A lot of people have mental health issues. I have mental health issues. I resent the implication that anyone one with mental health issues needs to be looked at with like skepticism and suspicion and and like they could potentially just break and do something like this. It's a stressful time. We all have stress. We need help with that. I resent that th that Letitia's lawyers are are making these little things that normal people go through that everybody can relate to and trying to put it over this case as if somehow we're supposed to think that her having anxiety and her being on the lorazepam and her having to see a therapist means she didn't know the difference between right and wrong. We're not here to wonder if Letitia had anxiety or if she was stressed. We're here to wonder if she knew the difference between right and wrong. Okay, and nothing about having anxiety means that you don't know the difference between right and wrong. So 
Al says this, and he's like, I never, ever felt that she was blurry about, you know, what was right and what was wrong. It didn't ever feel like she was unsure about that. He said even right before Gannon's murder, like in the weeks and the days leading up to it, Letitia acted as she always had. She acted completely normal. She was completely with it. There was no signs that she was having any issues or she was struggling or she was having a mental break. In fact, Letitia had taken Gannon and Lena hiking, right? I think just the day before Gannon died. She'd managed to get there by following all the traffic instructions. She hadn't gotten pulled over or gotten a ticket. She'd obeyed all the laws. She wasn't driving erratically. She wasn't, you know, running through stop signs. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew that when there's a stop sign, you stop because she's she knew that's the right thing to do. That's the law. She wasn't lost. She hadn't had a break with reality. And Al said that Leticia showed no signs of a break in her mental sanity. And if he had seen any indication that she'd been having a hard time mentally, he never would have left the house. He never would have left his children with her simply because he wouldn't have wanted to put that pressure on her knowing she was already in a frail emotional state. And as far as Al knew, yes, Letitia had some form of anxiety and that was the extent of her mental health issues and it didn't affect their lives much besides causing some strain in their marriage. In your mind, um, did the defendant have anxiety? I'm not a medical professional, but I would say she had some form of it. She had, you know, some anxiety here and there about different things. Um, even if she had that anxiety in your um, lay opinion, uh, did she still, was she able to function? Absolutely. Could she make a meal? Absolutely. Could she make a Denver omelet if she wanted to? I, I, <laughs> maybe get some Chick-fil-A sandwiches, but yeah. I, okay. Yes. Could, could she scramble eggs? She could, yes. Put some cheese on the eggs? Yes, sir. Without burning herself? Yes, sir. What about uh, cut up vegetables? Yes, sir. Could she do that without cutting herself? Yes, sir. Did she ever run out in the street yelling, screaming naked? Not that I remember, no, sir. Letitia's over here listening to this, and she's like, damn, all I had to do to make my insanity case was run out in the street screaming naked? I could have done that. If I'd known, I would have done that. I could have easily done that. <laughs> damn. Next, the court heard from witness Macon Ponder, who was a bridge inspector with the Florida Department of Transportation from Panama City, Florida. Ponder testified that on March 17, 2020, he had been tasked with inspecting a long concrete bridge called the Escambia River Bridge near Pensacola, Florida. I'm assuming, does the bridge go over the Escambia River? Yes, sir. And does the river go into the Gulf of Mexico? Eventually, the river actually dumps out into Escambia Bay, and then Escambia Bay goes out to the pass and then into the Gulf of Mexico. So could you please tell the jury uh, about March 17, 2020? Um, did you locate something? Uh, did you locate a suitcase underneath the bridge? Yes, sir. Um, during that inspection, the particular bridge that we were inspecting requires an underbridge inspection machine. That tip, the particular machine allows us to gain access to the underside of the bridge due to the height and over water. Um, as we were inspecting the underside of the bridge and we're coming to the end of it, uh, my, my partner and I that were in the basket noticed a suitcase in the, towards the end of the bridge, um, close to, it's kind of laying in a marshy area and a little bit of woods right next to the edge of the bridge. And um, we just noticed it down there. It was point of interest when we got down there. Um, we didn't look at it then. We just made a note to, to come back to it um, later on. And so you note that there's a suitcase there, but then you go on with the inspection? Yes, sir. What happens when you get back to that area where the suitcase is? Um, because of the profile and the, uh, as the bridge, it, there's the hump in the bridge. Um, when we got towards the end of the structure, the bridge starts to become lower, closer to the ground. Um, and at that point, we didn't need the truck anymore. So we were able to lower the basket down to the ground line and get out and was going to finish our inspection from there. Um, and that's when, when we lowered down to the ground, we've um, remembered that we had seen the suitcase. Uh, we finished up our inspection and then went back to the suitcase. And why did you go back to the suitcase? Pure curiosity. Okay. We got back to the suitcase and where it was lying, it was lying at kind of a uh, an odd angle, but the handle was towards the underside of the bridge. Um, so 
I mean, uh, I reached out for the handle and immediately noticed it was very, very heavy. <clears throat> um, and I looked back and remember telling Matt, I said, I, I don't know what's in this. I said, but it's heavy. I said, and where it was at, it had a possibility of being waterlogged. Um, we didn't know if there was clothing or something in it. We just noticed that whatever it was, was probably waterlogged and saturated um, just due to the how heavy it was. So it's kind of crazy to think that everything sort of had to work out perfectly for Gannon to even be found. Because when Letitia threw his body in that suitcase over this bridge, she was hoping that the evidence of her crime would be swept out to the Gulf of Mexico, right? Which is, I think he said, five or seven miles away. These bridges only get inspected every two years. And the last time the Escambia River Bridge had been inspected was two years prior in March. So the fact that Macon Ponder was even there to discover Gannon is a miracle, okay? But before we move on, I want to quickly go back to Macon Ponder's testimony right as he's describing seeing the suitcase that Gannon's body has been stuffed into and watch Letitia's lawyers while he's talking about this. Because of the profile and the uh, as the bridge, it, there's the hump in the bridge, um, when we got towards the end of the structure, the bridge starts to become lower, closer to the ground. Um, and at that point, we didn't need the truck anymore. So we were able to lower the basket down to the ground line <clears throat> and get out and was going to finish our inspection from there. Um, like, what the fuck is so funny? What is so funny? What could be amusing you so thoroughly that you have to chuckle about it? Like little gossip girls, Blair and Serena on the steps of the Met. While a man is talking about how he discovered the body of a child in a suitcase under a bridge. A child that your client shoved into that suitcase and then tossed over that bridge. I'm not asking for these two attorneys, these two men, to never smile again in their lives. I'm just asking that they refrain from doing so during this embarrassment of a trial. Okay? I can't e Like, what is so funny? <laughs> I just need to know. What is so funny you could not contain yourself? I, I don't understand. Do these lawyers not get it by this point that we don't like that? Normal people who are emotionally invested in these cases and in these victims, we don't like to see you making light of it. We don't like to see you gossiping and chatting and giggling and laughing and like, pss, 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 <laughs> pss, pss, <laughs> what is this? Mingya, I can't even say, oh, I'm so livid about it, okay? I just want them to be able to compose themselves in a professional way through the duration of the trial. Is that so much to ask? Because soon after this, the jury and everyone watching is going to have to listen to Mason Ponder describe how he and his partner began unzipping that suitcase. And then they were hit with the smell of decomposition that was so bad, it took them back. They'd come across dead things before, you know, animals. But the smell coming from the suitcase was so much stronger than that. And as they unzipped the suitcase further, the smell became almost unbearable. And that was when Mason saw two little feet clad in football socks. The, the, the smell was so overpowering. We, you know, we kind of stepped, took a step back. And the first thing I remember seeing was just two little feet and that had little football socks on them. The best I remember, that's I remember to be in little socks on them. And before I could, before anything else happened, we couldn't really make out what it was. Um, Matt dumped the suitcase over. And of course, we initially uh, immediately knew it was a body. Um, but after looking at it, it was, um, we, we couldn't tell male or female, um, boy or girl, we just, we didn't know. Um, a lot of black hair. I just, and then I turned away. And was there anything else in the suitcase besides the body? Um, lots of blankets. Um, <clears throat> there, I, there may have been a pillow or something. I just remember a lot of bedding, um, bedding in there and blankets. And it was kind of the, the body was in a fetal position and partially wrapped up. So we couldn't, we couldn't tell a whole lot until we dumped it out. And again, I, I turned my head. I'm really glad that Letitia's attorneys were able to keep their composure during this portion of Macon Ponder's statement. At least they were able to pretend that they were, you know, um, serious about it. I don't know. But, yeah, little football socks, right? And Macon Ponder says, I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. I just saw a lot of black hair. 
And then later, um, the detective, the first police officer on the scene in Florida who was assigned to this case and who was assigned to figure out who this this body was, who these remains belonged to, he also said something similar about noticing certain features that that let him know it was Gannon. Um, you know, because once they figured out that they had this child in the suitcase, they had to figure out was there a child missing who matched this child's description. And the police officer said that he noticed a gap between the teeth of the child in the suitcase. And as we know, Gannon Stalk had a you know prominent gap between his two front teeth, and he had this beautiful, like shiny black hair. After Mason Ponder and his partner Mike found the suitcase, they called the police from Mike's cell phone and Escambia County Sheriff's Office investigator Jason Yoder was assigned to the case. And this was the guy I was just talking about. This gave him the responsibility of finding out who the child in the suitcase was and what had happened to this child. And Jason Yoder is also asked by the state's attorney about a hotel called the Candlewood Suites in Pensacola, Florida. Now, if you had been keeping up with the preliminary hearings, which had happened in 2021, you'd know why this question was asked. First of all, there's a direct route down Highway 90 from that hotel to the Escambia River Bridge. And secondly, we know that Letitia Stelk made a reservation at this hotel for February 4th, 2020. Hotel employee Alexis Peck, she's going to later testify in this trial that Letitia checked in just after midnight on February 4th and checked out the same day at 11 a.m. Furthermore, on February 4th, around 4.15 a.m., Letitia's cell phone and vehicle pinged just three miles from where Gannon's body would be discovered under that bridge. So this get, it's a little confusing if you didn't keep up with the pretrial motions, if you didn't read through the affidavit thoroughly. So let's go back a bit for a more succinct timeline of Letitia's movements in the days after Gannon disappeared. Disappeared. Uh, January 28th, 2020, right? This is the morning after Gannon is killed. Letitia traveled to the airport to pick up her husband, Al, who was out of state for training with the military, but he was flying home because his son was missing. Now, remember, Al said that when Letitia came to pick him up, she had to go and get a rental car because she told him that she left her car at a local elementary school so that she wouldn't be putting a ton of miles on it while they were looking for Gannon. And then a friend had dropped her off at the airport. And then that's when she had to get a rental car, which they never even ended up using to look for Gannon. Now, the police believe that Letitia drove her car with Gannon's body in it to the airport that day. And then she left it there in short-term parking. She returned later in the evening to recover it. Now, that afternoon, Letitia also had a meeting at the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. She stopped at Starbucks first, of course. But then later that night at around 8 p.m., after she'd recovered her car from the airport and after she'd recovered Gannon's body from the airport, Letitia was in the area of Palmer Lake. And that's where law enforcement would later find that wooden board that had blood on it. They believe that this is where she basically hid Gannon's body temporarily. So she kills him. She puts him in a suitcase. And then when the police come there at night on the 27th to take the missing persons report, Gannon's body is in the suitcase in the house, in the basement. And then she moves that suitcase with Gannon's body in it. And she puts it in her car. And then she parks her car at the airport, gets a rental car, picks up Al, comes back later for her car for Gannon's body, brings it over to that area where that bloody board was found, and she leaves the suitcase there, hides it someplace. This was her first trip to that area, and at that point, she either shut off her phone completely or put it in airplane mode so that her movements couldn't be traced. But the GPS on the vehicle she was driving, that that filled in the blanks for the police. On January 29th, Letitia had another meeting with the police, and at that time, her cell phone and her vehicle were seized. On January 31st, police believed that Letitia drove a car that her aunt had rented back to that Palmer Lake area and picked up Gannon's body. On February 1st, Letitia rented a cargo van in Colorado Springs. This van also had a GPS tracker on it. And then she went to Walmart in Trinidad and purchased a new cell phone. After getting that cell phone, it was discovered she made several calls using the Star 67 feature, which would block her number from caller ID. So investigators believe that Letitia went back to the Palmer Lake area where she'd left Gannon's body temporarily. She recovered the suitcase with his body in it, and then she drove from Colorado to Pensacola, Florida that same day. They also believe that it was the morning of February 4th when she dropped Gannon's body in the suitcase off the bridge, and then she continued to travel from Florida to South Carolina, where she would eventually be arrested. So those are kind of like her movements. 
When Gannon's body was found in that suitcase, he was wearing his football socks, jogging pants with a stripe down the side, and a shirt made out of some, like, athletic material. In the suitcase with him was various bedding from his bed, from his bedroom, where he had been murdered, in bed in his own bedroom. There were sheets, blankets, and a pillow, and all of this bedding matched the bedding that had previously been on Gannon's bed. They'd find two bullet fragments inside that pillow. Now, the defense gets up and tries to make it sound like only a crazy person would choose the Escambia River Bridge to dump a body in because it wasn't the biggest bridge in that area. And, you know, Letitia hadn't even made sure that the suitcase had gone in the water. So clearly she wasn't in her right mind. The defense isn't trying to say that Letitia didn't do it, that she didn't dump his body over the bridge. They're just saying the fact that she chose that bridge and the fact that she didn't make sure that the suitcase had gone in the water, that meant she was clinically insane (laughs) or maybe she's just bad at crime I don't know maybe she's just bad at crime then the prosecution gets up and they have uh, Detective Yoder clarify that the Escambia River Bridge has no lights and it was not as heavily trafficked as other bridges that the defense had referred to Um, so basically like well, she chose this bridge specifically because it was close to the hotel she was staying at and because there's no lights. So if you're there at night or very early in the morning, like 4 a.m., you're not going to be spotted. And there's not a lot of traffic going over that bridge at that time. And Detective Yoder did testify that there would have been very little or no traffic on that bridge at 4 a.m. After this, we were able to hear from the police officer from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office in Colorado. Um, this was the police officer who'd responded to Letitia's 911 call, where she claimed that Gannon had left to go play with a friend and never returned. I do apologize, but I did not catch his name. He did say it, but the feed cut out as he was saying it. Um, maybe Letitia was holding her hand over the microphone again, but um, I just couldn't hear his name. What this police officer did contribute to the trial, though, was video footage from the body cam he'd been wearing on January 27th, 2020, while he questioned Letitia about her stepson. In this version, they will play just an audio version later in the trial, and it's easier to hear, but in this version, it's hard to hear most of what Letitia is saying. The sound is bad or non-existent in large portions. But from what I did hear, Letitia told the police that when Gannon had left the house, he'd had his Nintendo Switch with him in a blue or red case. And we'll know later the Nintendo Switch is recovered, not with Gannon. She also claimed that a lady had messaged her on Facebook and that this lady had sent a picture of Gannon, who'd been seen somewhere local, and his Nintendo Switch can be seen with him in the picture. So she thinks, like, Gannon's out there somewhere and we gotta go find him. Like, why are you talking to me? We gotta go find him. Somebody spotted him. The police are like, well, that's a great lead. Like, this could really help us. Let's see the picture. And Letitia was like, oh, well, I have so many Facebook messages, like over 150. So I can't find it right now. But like, trust me. Trust me. I I got it. It's here. And Letitia keeps bringing up like the bath salts thing, right? Um, If you're not familiar, like I said, with the pretrial stuff, with the affidavit stuff, like she kept suggesting to everybody, Al, Harley, uh, the police, Gannon's been talking about bath salts. You know, he texted something about, oh, do we have bath salts? And like, you know, he's hanging out with kids. Maybe they're like doing bath salts. And I think all of this shows that Letitia is not having a mental break. She's not clinically insane. She's pretending that nothing happened with the police. She's acting, you know, very what I think she believes to be normally, right? She's remaining calm and in control. She's not freaking out. She's telling a bunch of stories that will send the people who are looking for Gannon in a completely different direction. She really wants to make sure that the police at this moment believe Gannon is a runaway so that they're not looking at her, so they're not spending too much time in the house that she recently cleaned up because of the crime scene of her brutally murdering her 11-year-old stepson. She doesn't want them to stay there too long. She doesn't want them to look around too much. She definitely doesn't want them to bring in, like, dogs or a forensics team. And if they suspect her, that's what they're going to do, like they did with Chris Watts right? She wants them to believe her, to find her to be likable and reliable, and she wants them to get the hell out of there so that they go and look someplace else so that she can focus on, you know, making sure she covered her tracks thoroughly. Just listen to this quick exchange between Letitia and the police officer and how she's trying so hard to sound completely relaxed and normal as if everything's all right. And I mean, technically, she does it well. You know, considering that this is the same day within hours that she murdered an 11 year old boy, right? By beating him, by shooting him. Oh, it's so hard to talk about. 
this is the same day hours after she did this. And she sounds completely fine. She sounds like she's chatting at some singles mixer. And this exchange happens between Letitia and the police officer, I think, after he goes down into the basement to look around. And the suitcase that held Gannon's body can actually be seen in his body cam footage. Is that something down there, sir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I show you my box? So if I just didn't want to step on the cutter, the box thing, yeah. I think I still had down there. Okay, because you weren't in here, you weren't in here in the beginning, right? I thought I had, I didn't know if I had that box cutter and all that stuff in there, because I told him about, he dropped the candle last night. Oh, okay. And I was, I thought, I must have picked it up. I was just making sure I didn't want you to be like, oh, it was the box cutter. But yeah, I had to cut this, and I told them I wasn't even going to tell that, and... I was going to figure out a way to put this in there from the situation, but... At least you like got a that. carpet. Yeah, got right. Carpet. I just took it and, like, covered up with the carpet and stuff like that, but... Is it, does he have any carpet. friends around here? Um, there is a... I hear this one was saying. He did have this one, like, boat thing. It's where you're supposed to be at down the road. But they checked that already? They went over there and talked to it, and they're like, no, we haven't seen him at all. Okay. He did have this, like, uh... And you talked to parents, right? You didn't talk to... Yeah, Connor's mom came over, who right. is a friend he goes, hangs out with all the time. Um, So they come over. The people here, the, the friends, they were just the ones that were the door with the bike. Okay. They came over. A bunch of people came over. Yeah, so... Any, any he friends? Did, he did have, like, a little book that had um names on it, but I don't know... No. See it, like, anywhere specifically. Because, like, his wallet... He doesn't, he's not like a, I teach fifth grade and like, you know, you got your like really, really chore, mature boy, kind of boys, but then what, waiting, he forgets to like bring this or bring that or bring this or bring that. You know? okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, so, clo no clothes are missing or nothing? No, we actually lay out all the clothes all the time. Like for, you know, like every day at school, we lay out clothes, we do whatever. Is his jacket gone? He had on a, we, he has several jackets. Like he might, it depends on, I'm, I'm very like fashion. So like it, it just depends on jackets. Like he might have this black one with this, or there's a blue one with this. So he had a jacket. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Several jackets. Like when I mean, you see the kid has, you know, like tons and tons of clothes and he just, you know, he has all that stuff. So. Okay. Um, knowing what we know about the situation. Yes. Letitia does sound a little manic, a little nervous, most likely because she doesn't like police officers close to where she'd hidden Gannon, and she may have been unsure about the thoroughness of her own cleaning job. And honestly, her behavior during this initial house walkthrough probably did raise red flags because I do believe that she thought she was acting normal. And maybe in in other situations, this would be how she normally acted. You know, like I do have a tendency to sound the same way, to sound manic and nervous all the time. And that's not suspicious for me. It's just completely normal behavior because I get like anxiety and I'm stressed out and I get like fixated on things. So maybe on any other day, in any other context, in any other situation, um, this would have been how she normally acts. But in this context, this is not normal, right? It's really not. She's over explaining. She's nervously flitting from subject to subject, but she isn't nervous in the way a parent would be when their child's missing. She isn't scared or concerned or worried. She's not uh, crying. She's not like, oh my God, I just want to make sure he comes home. I'm so worried. She sounds like happy and carefree. She kind of she kind of sounds like a guilty kid. A guilty kid that got caught doing something they shouldn't have, and then they just do too much after. You know, when you walk in and your kid doing something, you're like, what are you doing? You're like, what? Hey, oh my God, you look great, mom. Like, what? Is that a new top? I love your eye makeup. I'm not doing anything. You're just hanging out, hanging out in my room. Don't look at my carpet where I spilled something. I, everything's good. Everything. Like, that's how she sounds. And as always, Letitia takes every opportunity to paint Gannon in a bad light and to paint herself in a positive light. And this kind of makes her look horrible. Because the police are asking her questions, which they hope will lead them to Gannon. And she's answering in the most ludicrous ways, okay? So, for instance, she brings up the candle incident. You know, that kid is trouble. That kid is trouble. He does things, but, you know, I just cut the carpet out. Um, I, I tried to fix it. tried to cover it up. I wasn't even really planning on telling his dad. I'm a good stepmother. You know, I'm not trying to throw Gannon under the bus, but, like, he is a handful. Yeah, Gannon. You know, his wallet, like sometimes he had his wallet. I don't know. You know, he wasn't a mature 11 year old. I teach fifth grade, so I can definitely tell the difference between like a mature kid and a non mature kid. And he just sort of like, 
oh, you know, leave stuff. He's supposed to bring it. He says he's going to bring it, but he doesn't bring it. And the cops over here are like, okay, I didn't ask for all this, man. I did not ask for all this. Why are you rambling? What are you hiding? And then the cop, my favorite part, he's like, did he have a coat? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had lots of coats, you know. I'd make sure his clothes were laid out every morning. And I'm very into fashion. And I'm a very fashion-focused person. So he would have, like, maybe a silver coat to go with, like, black pants and, like, a blue coat to go with, like, red pants because I'm very fashionable. And it's like, then the cops says, but he had a coat, right? Like, that's all he wanted to know. Did he have a coat? And did Gannon have the coat on? When he left, because it's going to get cold tonight. That's what they're concerned about when a young kid goes missing at the end of January when snow is expected that night and frigid temperatures are expected that night. They want to know, did he have a coat? And she's like, yeah, you know, I'm very fashionable. So I made sure that he had like lots of coats and I laid his clothes out for him every morning. Why are you saying that? That's not what he asked. No one cares. No one cares that you laid his clothes out for him in the morning. How does you telling this police officer that you lay his clothes out in the morning help them find Gannon? Right. And it doesn't because she told them he was wearing jeans and some other shirt. But we know he was found in like athletic pants and an athletic shirt. So she's not even actually giving them the correct outfit that he's seen last wearing. So it's just so frustrating to me. I can only imagine how frustrating it was to the police. And I do think that her behavior, which she thought was normal, because maybe this is how she talked to her friends or her family or whatever, was so abnormal in that situation, in that context, that the police immediately became suspicious. Okay, so we're now moving on to day four of the trial, and I am going to skip over the first couple of witnesses because they're crime scene people and forensics people, and they are testifying about a lot of things we already know, such as the fact that the body in the suitcase was confirmed to be Gannon through DNA. CSI tech Kelly Smith, she described arriving at the scene seeing the olive green suitcase from afar, and then she saw like something laying next to it, and she had to get closer to realize it was the body of a child with all these sheets and blankets. And uh, she also described this indentation that was believed to have been made when the suitcase was thrown from the bridge and then landed on that marshy soft ground. Smith also testified that a bullet had been found in Gannon's head during his autopsy and then two more had been recovered from his pillow and defects on the clothes that Gannon was wearing, his coat, pants, and t-shirt, were consistent with injuries he had suffered from. Um, we are going to talk about this a little bit more at the beginning of the next episode because we're going to talk about Gannon's autopsy. Um, I was not able to do that in this video. I just was not ready. But then after this, Leslie Hicks took the stand. Now, she'd been the assistant principal at Mountain Ridge Middle School, and she'd interviewed Letitia for the position of a resource teacher in January of 2020, the same month that Gannon would be murdered. And the way that Letitia handled this interview process... <laughs> It makes me feel like she genuinely did not want a job. It makes me feel like she genuinely did not want to work. That she really hoped they wouldn't offer her the position. Okay, so Letitia interviewed for the position in person. And during this interview, Letitia claimed she had a doctorate from Liberty University. She signed her emails, Dr. Stauk. And Leslie Hicks texted Letitia on January 16th, 2020. Quote, hi, Tisha. This is Leslie Hicks at MRMS. I left you a phone message yesterday. Can you call or email me? I'd like to talk to you about the resource teacher position, end quote. Letitia responded, um, I have iMessages, so I'll email you. And then the next day, Leslie Hicks texted Letitia again, quote, Hi, Tisha. This is Leslie Hicks again. I sent you an email yesterday. Is it possible for you to get back to me today? End quote. And once again, Letitia responded via text, telling Leslie she had already emailed her back. And this is a little uncommon to see, right? I've never seen it. A potential employer having to track down an applicant, like basically having to like stalk somebody to get them to respond to a job offer. You know, Leslie is basically begging Letitia to respond to her so that they can move forward in the hiring process. And I mean, just in my experience, you as the applicant have to be very responsive and very easy to get a hold of if you want to get that job. So as Leslie was trying to get in touch with Letitia, she was also checking Letitia's references. Uh, was the defendant able to provide you with some references? Yes, on her application, she had references. Um, and I was having trouble getting a hold of some of the references. And so through the course of our dialogue, um, I asked her for additional ones. Okay. Um, do you remember a particular reference uh, by the name of Connie Huddle? Yes. Uh, do you remember the first telephone number that was provided to you for Connie Huddle? Uh, I remember that it was an area code from South Carolina. Okay. Um, I 
believe it was, um, I know it started with a six, six. And that's four. fine. Okay. Fair to say it's been a while since you've seen that. Yes, it has. Okay. And do you recall giving a statement to Detective Marissa Williams on January 31st of 2020? Yes. Do you recall giving those specific telephone number to the detective that day? I do. And would seeing your statement refresh your recollection as to that specific telephone? Okay, who is Connie Huddle? Who is this person that they're referring to in this clip? This person that Letitia used as a reference on her job application. And according to Leslie, she'd already had trouble getting in touch with many of Letitia's references. So by the time she gets to Connie Huddle's name, um, she already kind of has had to contact Letitia and be like, hey, I didn't have a number for this person or this was the wrong number for this person. And Letitia had to give her more numbers and more references or, you know, corrected numbers, things like that, which is a red flag. But by the time she gets to Connie Huddle's name, Leslie's already had trouble getting in touch with a lot of Letitia's references. So when Leslie Hicks called the number for Connie Huddle, she said the name Eugene Stouk showed up on her caller ID and a female voice answered the phone. And Leslie Hicks said she could hear voices in the background. And when she asked if she was speaking to Connie Huddle, the female voice told her no and then hung up. Now, we know this number had a South Carolina area code. We know it was registered to Al Stouk. And it is believed that that number belonged to a phone that Gannon used. It was Gannon's phone number. Even though Leslie was unable to get in touch with several of Letitia's references, and even though Letitia had clearly given a fake reference, you know, Connie Huddle, for some reason, she was offered the position anyways. And Letitia's first day at her new job was to be January 22nd, 2020. She was going to be there bright and early at 7.30 a.m. She was told she was going to be shadowing the sub that had temporarily been handling the class she was going to take over. And she could, you know, spend that day to sort of get integrated, meet the students, get used to being in the classroom. Now, Letitia must have shown up for her first day. She must have. But I don't know for sure, but she must have because she would later text Leslie Hicks that afternoon on the 22nd saying, quote, I wanted to ask your guidance about what to do about tomorrow. I had scheduled that interview with the district office before getting hired. I understand that they probably have someone in mind, but I don't want to burn any bridges. And I would like to at least let them know my interest in eventually moving up later, even if it's a year or so. I know we all have to start somewhere. What do you think is the best approach to take? End quote. So this is about a different job that Letitia is saying she had set up an interview for ahead of time with the district office. So still in the school district, but with the district office, like administrative, I think. And so she's saying, I know that you've given me the job and I've already started working, but I still kind of want to take this interview because I don't want to like piss anybody off. And I do want to eventually like move up. And Leslie responded, listen, it's your choice whether or not you want to interview. But if you do decide to not come into work for an hour or for the day so that you can go to this interview, you are going to have to arrange for a sub and then find a way to make up the classes that you're going to be missing. And Letitia responded, quote, okay, I will just try to do the right thing by everyone. I didn't want to stand anyone up and I want to be loyal to our school too, end quote. Bitch, our school? You've worked there for a day, barely. You've been there for one day, okay? But She's um she's got to make herself seem like just the nicest person ever. Like, I'm just only asking, not for myself, not because I think I deserve better, but uh, because I just want to be loyal and make everyone happy. And I just want everyone to get along. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. So she's only been working for one day at this school where she was shadowing another teacher. And it seemed like Letitia was already trying to get out of going to work, right? Because did she actually have an interview with the district office that day? Who knows? She said something like, oh, they say I can do my fingerprints and stuff when I go in, right? Because what Letitia had to do to work at this this middle school that she got hired for as a resource teacher, she had to do a background check, do fingerprints, stuff like that. And she hadn't done that yet. So she was telling Leslie Hicks, I can do it there. They're going to do all of that for me. And so it kind of kills two birds with one stone. And that wasn't true because she never did go anywhere that morning. She didn't get her fingerprints done. I don't even know if she had a interview with the district office or if she just didn't want a background check done on her. Now, January 24th, three days before Gannon's murder, Leslie Hicks said that she saw Letitia and she noticed nothing off about Letitia's demeanor on that day. This would be the last day that she would see Letitia in person. Letitia was running a class of kids, and Leslie felt that she didn't appear to be going through any mental health crisis. Nothing was really wrong. But 
According to Letitia, she would soon be going through a different kind of crisis the following Monday, the day that Gannon dies, right? On Monday, January 27th at 3 a.m., Letitia texted Leslie Hicks, quote, I'm sorry for the time of night message, but my stepfather passed away. Someone hit him with a car while he was walking. I can update you at a later time, end quote. <laughs> My stepfather passed away. Someone hit him with a car while he was walking. Like, those are two different things, okay? <laughs> those are two different things. But reportedly, Letitia sent this exact same message to Leslie again at 4.37 a.m. And Leslie responded at 5.50 a.m. saying, quote, Oh, my goodness, Letitia, I'm so sorry. Shall we try to find a sub for you today? End quote. And Letitia, in all of her glorious and unearned audacity, responded, quote, Question mark, question mark. It's apparent. All my family lives on the East Coast. I'm trying to find a way to get there, end quote. And Leslie wrote back, quote, okay, I'm just trying to understand your plans so we can find coverage. Am I understanding you will not be in today? End quote. And Letitia's livid about this. Like, she's so pissed. And she texted to Leslie, quote, yes, it's my parent. I can't believe that would not be an assumption in a time like this, end quote. And listen. While I understand that in normal circumstances, we might side with someone like Letitia, who had just lost a parent, and we would wonder, why is her employer acting so dense about needing to cover the shift? Like, why are you even thinking that she's going to come in that day? But this is Letitia, and we are never on her side, right? Because we know her stepfather hadn't passed away or gotten hit by a car, and she has the balls to act put out that she isn't being fawned over when she delivers this news, that she isn't being immediately accommodated. It isn't even true. It didn't even happen. And she's literally so offended by it. I can't wrap my head around it. You're lying about your stepfather being hit by a car and dying so that you can stay home for some reason on this day. And this would have been like her fourth day of work, right? And she'd already tried backing out of her shift to go to a different interview a few days before. And now she's got some story about her father being hit by a car while he's out walking. No, I'm sorry, her stepfather. I wonder, was this one of the stepfathers who'd abused her as a child? Is her attorney going to claim, Leticia wasn't lying about this, okay? Actually, one of her other personalities had fantasies about her stepfather being, you know, run over by a car. I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised, man, if they tried to say that. But either way, Leslie Hicks is like, I'm sorry. I just I can't assume anything. You know, like I was just trying to clarify what you needed from us in this moment. I can't assume anything, which is accurate. You cannot assume anything with Letitia. Letitia had texted this initially to Leslie Hicks at like 3 a.m. So my question is, what happened at 3 a.m. or just before that would have caused Letitia to know in that moment that she could not go to work that day? Something had happened that was so bad that needed her immediate attention to the point where she felt she had to make up a story about her stepfather being dead so that she could remain home with Gannon that day because Gannon stayed home from school. Lena went to school. His little sister, Lena, went to school. We know that Gannon was still alive that morning, Monday, January 27th, and he was still alive early that afternoon when he and Letitia returned home from Petco. But had he been injured or hurt by her earlier that morning? I think so, yes. Maybe something that coincided with the candle incident, you know, maybe because she had set him on fire for absolutely no reason while he was sleeping. And then when she realized how bad it was, she knew that she had to kill him and get rid of the evidence. And, you know, a shift at the school teaching these pesky middle schoolers, that would make her plans for that day impossible. So she's like, why are you even asking me if I'm coming in? Like, don't you know what I'm dealing with here? <laughs> like, her, she's so, oh my God, the, the, just the audacity. I can't even. But let's turn to Letitia's internet search history for the early morning hours of January 27th and kind of see if we can figure out what's going on. Actually, Let's take it one step further. Let's look at her internet search history from the previous two days as well, right? January 25th at 12.16 p.m. in the afternoon, she Googled find real military singles, followed by parenting should be four people and not one at 1.40 p.m. Also at 1.40 p.m., a Google search for I'm overdoing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help, followed by similar searches such as if you aren't involved in your kid's life, you are shitty. And my husband's ex-wife does nothing for her kids. And I wonder if my husband's ex-wife is sending me a Valentine's Day card since I raise her kids. She Googled that one three different times because I guess either A, she was expecting Google to give a firm answer to that question, or B, she was really wondering if she was going to get a card. 
a Valentine's Day card from Landon. She thought she was going to get, what, like a cookie, a parade, a pat on the back for marrying a man who had children and then being expected to act as a stepmother to those children? Like, what? Another Google search says, one day some people will wish they had treated you differently, which is totally true. Totally true. Because I am sure that Al Stauk is wishing he had treated you differently, T. Like, I, I think he's wishing that he had left your ass on that softball field where he found you, Okay. That's how he wishes he had treated you differently, by never allowing you into his life. And then another Google search, why should my husband choose me over family, um, which is so transparent, right? That tells me a lot about who she is and what she's feeling because I think she wanted to ask, why should my husband choose me over his kids? And she knew the answer to that would always be that he shouldn't. Even Google would know that, okay? If she asked Google that, Google would have responded, what's wrong with you, bitch? Your husband should not choose you over his kids ever. What is wrong with you? Why would you even ask that? Google would have shamed her. I'm glad she didn't ask Alexa because Alexa would have made her feel sorry that she'd asked. Alexa would have made Letitia feel like a complete garbage. Alexa can be very judgy. So I believe that Letitia kind of knew what the answer was going to be if she'd asked that of Google. And so she said family instead of kids. But like Elle's kids are his family, you know, just like um, her daughter Harley was her family. And was there ever a point, Letitia, where you were choosing Elle over Harley? I don't think so. I don't think there was ever a point where Letitia put anybody before herself, right? I don't think that there was a time where she put Al before herself. I don't think there was a time where she put Al before Harley. I don't think that she really respected him or loved him at all. And it did seem from these Google searches and from what we know about Letitia, she had a big issue with having to be the full-time parent of Gannon and Harley, which, I mean, what else was, she wasn't working full-time, you know? If you look at what she was doing, she was taking jobs for a short time and then she would leave that job or get fired. She was going to be like an uh, an airline attendant at one point. Is that what they're called? Airline attendants? Like a stewardess? Uh, she was going to be a flight attendant at some point. She was like going to training for that or something. She didn't know what the hell was going on. But what we do know is Al had a full-time job. He was the one paying the bills. He was the one bringing, you know, the finances in. So just by default, if you don't have a job or you can't hold on to a job, you're going to be tasked with the home stuff, with parenting, helping with homework, cooking, cleaning, stuff like that. It just makes sense. So we know that she clearly had a lot of resentment and anger over the fact that she was parenting Gannon and Harley and Landon wasn't helping. But you wouldn't know that, you know, having to parent these children was such a big issue for her because a few hours later, she made a bunch of searches that were kind of a little contradictory, kind of a little hypocritical. So for instance, find me a rich guy who wants me to take care of his kids. So she's willing to play mom as long as she is married to a rich guy or as long as the father of those kids is rich. Not if she loves him, not if she wants to build a life and a family with him, not if she wants to build something with him and create a life with him, only if he's rich, you know? Um, it, it can't just be that she would willingly and happily parent or mother the children of her husband because she loved her husband. <laughs> it's got to be that he's rich. And she has a lot of Google searches like this. Find me a rich man who will pay me to take care of his kids. Like Al was paying you to take care of his kids. You were spending all his money. So you already had that technically. But around 9 p.m. on the evening of January 26th, Letitia searched, parents are those who put their kids nails first. I think she meant needs. Parents are those who put their kids' needs first, but she did type nails twice. Um, it's giving <sighs> the energy. It's giving like searching for some aesthetic quote box that you can passively, aggressively post on Facebook. So everyone knows that something is wrong. But when they ask you, what's going on or what's wrong, you'll respond that you don't want to talk about it, okay? That's what it's giving. Like she was typing like, parents are those who put their child's needs first. And she was hoping that some like fancily calligraphered, curly cued, you know, picture quote would come up that she could post on Facebook to let Al know she's pissed, to let Landon know she's pissed, and to let everybody else know that she's a martyr and a saint for what she does, you know, because she was not shy about talking about how much she hated Landon and how much she resented having to do what she thought was Landon's job. And you'll see that later when she talks to a neighbor of hers that she meets for the first time. She's like spilling it all out. She's not shy about this. So everybody who's following her on Facebook is going to know immediately what that means. And that to me is 
what she was doing on the internet. She's just like trying to find a way to make herself look like more of a victim because she wants sympathy and she wants like people to say, oh, poor you, they're their little one. Just a few hours later, after that search, at 12.09 a.m. on January 27th, the tone of Letitia's Google searches shifts. And she searched, my son burned the carpet. How do I fix it? And then she Googled asking about a humidifier. Would a humidifier help with smoke exposure? And then there was some searches centered around what the law was in Colorado for kids staying home alone. Now, around the same time that Letitia texted Leslie to let her know that her stepfather had been killed in a hit and run, she was searching for suede repair kits for sofas. Um, and we kind of know what this means. This is the whole candle fell and burned the carpet, burned the sofa, et cetera, et cetera. Is Letitia searching this stuff because she honestly wants to know how to repair the fire damage or is she searching it because she knows that people will be looking at her phone and seeing her searches and so she's trying to kind of already build that narrative? I don't know. I don't know. But like I said, Letitia also called Gannon's school that morning and said he wasn't coming in. And then she took a picture of Gannon sleeping in bed and she sent it to Al. And I believe that was around like 8.30 in the morning if I remember correctly. And at this time, police believe that Gannon was alive because they do think he left with Letitia to go to Petco at 10, 16 a.m. and that he did return with her at 2, 19 p.m. Now it is going to be in this window of time between when they got home around like 2.20 and when Lena, Gannon's little sister, returned home from school around 3.15 p.m. that authorities believe Letitia murdered Gannon. So just like an hour, 45-minute window. And then she began a cleaning frenzy to hide the evidence because by 4.52 p.m., Letitia was sending her daughter Harley a list of cleaning supplies to pick up and bring home. And remember when Lena got home at 3.15, Letitia told her, oh, you can't come inside right now, Gannon's sleeping, just go outside and, and ride your bike. And there is surveillance footage, ring doorbell footage and stuff, showing Lena outside riding her bike at that time, and she was absolutely not allowed to come in. And then Letitia had Harley come and pick Lena up and take Lena to go get these cleaning supplies and bring back home so that Letitia could continue cleaning all of the blood that had spilled all over Gannon's room when she'd murdered him. Understand this brutal attack on Gannon happened in a very short window. Was it planned? Had she been planning to do this the whole day and that's why she had asked for the day off? What happened to Gannon where she felt that he needed to be dead or she was going to be in hot water? She must have done something really horrible to him. She must have hurt him very, very, very badly to the point where she knew if he was still alive when his father got home, or if he was still alive and anybody saw him, she was done for. What happened around that 4 a.m. time, you know, before, right before maybe, or, you know, shortly before within that hour that caused Letitia to want to take the day off and that set off a domino effect, which led to Gannon's death. Now, clearly, in my opinion, Letitia had been stewing for a few days before the 27th of January. She was getting more and more angry, building more and more resentment, holding it all in, just kind of almost, uh, you know, when you're sad and you turn on sad music so you can just feel more sad. It was like she was reveling in her anger, reveling in her resentment, reveling in her negative feelings towards her husband's kids. And I think that she did this to the point she got herself into such a frenzy that she finally took it out on Gannon. I think he was sleeping and she saw him sleeping and it just infuriated her. Like she maybe she's thinking, why does he get to sleep peacefully? Why does he get to have any peace, any rest when, when these kids are causing me so much turmoil, when I've done everything for them and nothing's good enough? And then I think that she – I think she attacked him. I literally think she set him on fire while he was sleeping. That is my theory. Now, the next witness we're going to talk about is a young woman named Janine Sanchez. And Janine worked with Letitia's daughter, Harley, at Massage Envy. How did you know Miss Harley Hunt? So we worked together um, at Massage Envy, and then we'd occasionally go to Bible study together. Are you similar in age with her? I'm about a couple years older than her. Okay. <clears throat> And you said you worked at Massage Envy. Did you both share the same type of job, or did you have different jobs at that at that uh, employer? We were both receptionists. Would you see each other often at work? I would say, depending on the shift, yes. Okay. And then you mentioned that you would sometimes go to Bible studies together. Did you ever hang out any other times outside of work besides those types of uh, gatherings? No. Okay. 
Did you have each other's phone numbers? Yes. Would you sometimes text with each other? Yes. Would that you know, include potentially sending jokes, uh, memes, um, TikToks, that kind of thing? Yes, we would send TikToks to each other. Um, how would you describe Harley's demeanor? Um, she was very nice. Was she uh, social or was she shy? She was both. Uh, she was shy at first, and then once you got to know her, she was more social. Would you say she had a positive personality or a negative personality? Positive. Um, bubbly or angry? Bubbly. Okay. Was she nice to people or mean to people? She was nice. On January 29th, 2020, Janine and Harley worked together. And Janine said during this shift, Harley seemed different. She seemed upset, she seemed frantic, and she was crying. After they left work together, they picked up Letitia from the hospital, and Harley was driving because it was her car. Janine was in the passenger seat, and Letitia got into the back seat. Now, at this point, Janine had never met anyone from Harley's family before. They were basically just work friends. They'd send each other TikToks sometimes, whatever. But the first time she meets Harley's mother... Letitia exhibits some odd behavior. Janine said it was quiet for the most part during the car ride, and Janine commented that Harley was more quiet than usual and had been that way since her mother had gotten into the car. So Harley thanked Janine for allowing them to crash at her house for a bit, because at this point, Letitia and Harley had left Al's house. And actually, Janine said she didn't really know that Letitia was going to be staying at her house. Um, that night, she knew that Harley was. Harley had said she wanted to get away and just, you know, her little stepbrother was missing and she was stressed and she just didn't want to be home. So she wanted to sleep at Janine's house and Janine had said she could. So it was a weird situation that just got weirder because when Letitia got in the car, for some reason, even though it's a somber situation and her stepson was missing and she's being like suspected of it, she decided to make a joke. Do you remember a specific statement that the defendant made to you when she got into the car? Yes, I do remember that one okay. statement. And what was that one statement? Just jokingly how she was joking about saying, um, basically, hope you don't think we're a bunch of murderers. So the defendant said that to you? Yes. Did you find that to be weird? Yes. But other than that, the Demeter wasn't weird, just that one statement. Okay. So she wasn't acting like she was losing her mind or anything like that? No. Hope you don't think we're a bunch of murderers. No, no, we don't think that you are a bunch of murderers. We just think that you're a murderer, Letitia. Um, just a weird thing to say. A weird thing to say, considering it's only two days after Gannon's been missing. Um, hasn't been confirmed that he's dead. And that's not a funny joke. It's not a funny joke to make about an 11-year-old missing child. So Janine also testified to Letitia taking Harley's phone while they were driving, and she started using it in the backseat of the car, texting possibly, which would be fine, except that for some odd reason, Letitia sent Janine a text from Harley's phone while they were all in the car together. Um, do you, did you get a text from Harley's phone while the defendant had Harley's phone? Yes. Did that seem odd to you? Very. Why was that odd? Uh, because we were all in the car together, so there's really no point to be texting when we were all there. And what did that text say, if you remember? Not sure exact wording, but basically if her mom could stay as well. Did that seem to you to be then that it was almost like Harley was asking you if her mom could stay with you at your house? That's kind of a confusing question. I yeah. Think. Uh, more that Harley had originally asked to stay over and then later on asked if her mom could stay as well. Okay. But really it was her mom asking on her own using Harley's phone if she could stay. Yes. Did that seem weird to you since you're sitting right there and it could have been verbally said as opposed to texted? Yes. Yeah, very, very bizarre. Very bizarre. So Letitia has Harley's phone and she hears Harley tell Janine, thanks for letting me crash at your place tonight. And then Letitia, with Harley's phone, texts Janine, hey, do you mind if my mom stays with you tonight as well? <laughs> what? What? So it looks like, first of all, 
Whew, Letitia is very comfortable using other people's phones and texting as that person, right? We know that she's done this before. Take other people's phones and then pretend to be the owner of the phone. I'm fairly sure the majority of the texts sent from Gannon's phone on January 27th were sent from Letitia pretending to be Gannon, right? We have him talking to his father, Al, and saying, can I at least play Zelda and things like that. That was Letitia. OK, um, texting Harley and saying, hey, T left her phone at home. So text me here or text us here if you need to reach us. I believe that was Letitia. I believe every text message sent on January 27th was Letitia. I don't think Gannon was in any position to be texting or having conversations with anybody. And if he was, I think he would have told them that she had hurt him. OK, I think Letitia had Gannon's phone in her on her person with her in her hand the whole time. I don't think she let him have it once on the 27th. Um, and, and we know there was Google searches done, like, can my parents track me with my Nintendo Switch? Can Nintendo track me? Things like that. I think those those searches were also done by Letitia. And at this time, Letitia also stated out loud to Harley and Janine while they were in the car that she was turning off Harley's location services on Harley's cell phone. She said she was turning the location services off because she had to. But we know that Letitia and Harley are just in a couple of days going to take a road trip from Colorado to Florida. And that's why Letitia wanted Harley's location services turned off on her cell phone. Oh, and Letitia was also talking about how she thought the police had found evidence on her person and at the house about the carpet situation, like the fire that happened on the carpet that she was telling police about. She said they had found evidence of that, like maybe on her clothes. I don't know. I don't even know what she's talking about. But another reason we know that Letitia likes to take people's, you know, cell phones and pretend to be them is a neighbor of Letitia's from the Lorson Ranch neighborhood where Letitia and Al lived with the kids. She also testified, and her name is Nicole Mobley. And Nicole met Letitia when someone named Harley Hunt messaged Nicole on the Lorson Ranch Facebook page because Nicole's teenage niece was moving in with her and they needed some clothes for this girl. And so Harley Hunt messaged Nicole and was like, oh, I've got clothes. We will drop them off. And when the person showed up to drop the clothes off, it was Letitia Stouck, not Harley. Letitia stayed on the porch. She handed over the clothes, but then she started talking to Nicole. She and Nicole had a conversation. It was a little weird. Um, I didn't know her. I had never met her before that. And I was kind of off put first because I thought I was meeting a Harley Hunt. <laughs> um, and it obviously wasn't, but she didn't introduce herself as to who she was. And it was just kind of weird because I didn't know her and she was kind of just talking to me about life stuff and like we had been best friends. Okay. So it was a little off-putting, but. And do you remember about when this may have happened? It was right before Christmas, probably December 20 something. It was before Christmas of 2019. So it would have been December, 2019. Yeah. Um, was it the Christmas before you later learned that Gannon went missing? Yes. Okay. And so uh, was there anything unusual about this initial contact other than it seemed like she was spilling her guts to you? No, not really. Okay. Uh, did you have more conversation with her? I did. Um, she wrote me later on telling me she had forgot a pair of pants. That was just nothing. The next time was a couple days later on Christmas, she had sent me another message. And what was that message about? Do you recall? Yeah, she said that she was going on a work trip that she worked for an airline and she needed to go to a training and had asked if my teenage niece wanted to go over and basically watch the house, but also hang out with her teenage daughter. And so did the conversation come up back in December 2019 that, hey, maybe your niece and my daughter could get together, that kind of thing? Yeah, she said that her daughter Harley didn't really have any friends because she didn't go to school here. So she needed somebody to watch her house and help with the dogs and that it would be maybe a good way for them to kind of hang out too. Okay. And did that ever happen? And I didn't feel comfortable with it because I didn't know her and I wasn't sending my niece to somebody else's house. And was your niece living with you at that time? She was, yes. All right. When she was asking if we would come and stay, or if my niece could come and stay at the house, she had mentioned her husband works nights and is in the army and has gone a lot. She mentioned Harley because of hanging out with my niece. And then she mentioned, I think it was the little girl um, talking about her going to Grand Mountain, but I think that's it. I don't remember hearing anything else. 
And when you say talking about weird things, what do you mean? I just mean, I didn't know her, but she kind of talked to me like I knew her. <laughs> and just being frustrated at home life. It, it was a very short conversation. It was just, I think to me, the reason it's weird is because I didn't, if I don't know someone, I don't usually start talking about things like I know them and like I should know what they're talking about. So was it like, way too much information here? <laughs> yeah, kind of. And I'm used to, in the neighborhood, we do um, porch drop-offs. So you don't usually have to communicate with the person. They drop it off and leave. So you can tell Nicole is a true crime watcher. She was like, I didn't know these people. And I'm not sending my niece to their house. Love that, Nicole. Um, I think that Nicole also got some flack for being like, oh, it's just porch drop off and I don't like socializing with people and blah, blah, blah. And people, I was watching the live feed. I watched the live feed while this is going on and people were like, what do you mean? Or like, yo, some people don't like to socialize with other people when they're home, okay? They're home. It's their safe spot. They're not working. They, they don't, they no longer are forced to have to interact with other human beings. So when somebody almost like forces you to interact with them, in your own home, it feels like a huge trespass. It feels like a huge like break in boundaries. So she didn't say anything wrong. Leave Nicole alone. So keep in mind, this was the one time that Nicole Mobley met Letitia before Gannon went missing. And Letitia overshared, right? And I understand why she did this. It was almost as if she could not contain how unhappy she was at home. You know, it was almost as if she was just looking for anybody to unload on. And that's what happens often because I've been in that position on the other end of it because I worked sales for a long time where I would be like helping a customer with something, setting up their phone, and they all of a sudden like are telling me everything, everything bad that's ever happened or how upset they are, how depressed they are. And me, because I'm very uncomfortable with like heavy emotions when I'm not prepared for them, I would feel like somebody had unplugged me from the wall and I'm just like, oh. you know, but they are getting more energized by finally like saying this stuff out loud to somebody and almost like passing it on to another person. And at that point, you know, somebody is um, is past the point where they can now handle this resentment and this anger on their own. Like it's spilling out. It's spilling out of the cracks. And this had been in December of 2019, right before Christmas. Okay. So just a month before Gannon is killed. Nicole also did say that she knew eventually Letitia had a teenage daughter and Letitia had mentioned Lena once or twice, but Letitia never talked about Gannon. And Nicole found out that Gannon was missing through one of the neighborhood Facebook pages. And at that point, she didn't even put two and two together that Gannon was the stepson of this crazy lady that had sat outside and made her talk on the porch for longer than she wanted to. I thought it was kind of weird because we're all out here looking and it was very obvious that she was at her house and not out here looking. Why, um, why was that obvious? I, I'm i trying to remember exactly how. I mean, there was a lot of people that were going up to her house. And she was opening the door. <laughs> and you could just tell lights were on. I mean, plus, I met a majority of everybody that was out there. And none of them were her. And obviously, you had met her before. And so did you tie it together that Gannon Stout was living in the same house with Letitia Stout? Yeah, as soon as the post went up on the neighborhood page, I recognized her right away. She found out that Gannon was missing through one of the neighborhood Facebook pages. She just found out that a kid in the neighborhood was missing. And she, along with other residents, went out and searched for Gannon that night, even though it was freezing and it was getting colder the later it got. And it started to snow at some point. It was like so cold out there. But Nicole never saw Letitia out looking for Gannon. And then when Nicole reached out to Letitia, a woman who had been so eager to chat just a month prior, this happened. Did you reach out to Ms. Stalk and, and offer her to help or do anything in any way? That was another thing that kind of set me off. Um, the night that he went missing, I had sent her a message. I cannot remember what I said in it, but I remember it was something trying to get information like where we should be looking, and she blocked me immediately. What kind of message did you send her? Was it a text? Was it social media? Was it a phone message? How did you try to reach her? Facebook Messenger. Did you ever talk to her about why she blocked you or anything like that? Well, she blocked me, so I couldn't. I know my husband sent her a message saying, you know, I don't understand why you blocked my wife. We're just trying to help you. Is there something you have against her? Like, what's going on? But we never got a response. Letitia blocked her as if that is completely normal behavior, as if that's not suspicious at all when your stepson is missing, 
and everyone's out there searching for him and somebody messages you and like, can you give me more information so we can help in our search? And Letitia blocked her. I don't know why Letitia did it. I don't know what her reasoning was for. I don't know why she thought that would look good. I don't know. But I guess Nicole, she wanted to go undercover a little bit. And she knew that Letitia was not going to respond to her personal Facebook account because she'd blocked her. So Nicole eventually ended up making a fake Facebook account. And she pretty much pretended to be a Letitia supporter who was only interested in contacting Letitia so that she could help clear her name because she believed that there was other stuff happening that Letitia wasn't in control of. And she believed that Landon, Gannon's mother, was involved somehow, et cetera, et cetera. I ended up creating a fake Facebook page. And Talk about that. Why did you do that? I wanted to see if I could get her to respond to me. And I knew she wouldn't on my original page. And why did you want her to respond to you? I felt like the conversation that we had on my front porch the first time that I met her, I kind of could figure out ways to get her to communicate with me based off of her, per like, the kind of things that she wanted to talk about. So I figured if I wrote her on a different page and could get her to start talking, it, I mean, if I worded things properly, I might be able to get her to start talking to me. So did that happen? It did. Tell the jury about that. What did, what did you put in the Facebook page messenger to get her to start talking to you? I went on and kind of based it off, or started writing things based off of things that I had seen in the news or on uh, social media, like things that she was saying. She had a lot of, I think, hate for Landon. Um, and I think that I kind of started off with a combination of agreeing with her about things that involve Landon. And I also, um, there was a video that came out about a truck in a shadow. And I also wrote her saying, I believed her about the shadow under the truck. Yeah. So I continued on Facebook Messenger and then eventually we did make it onto a texting app. Tell us about the texting app. Whose idea was it to use a texting app? She had asked me to download a texting app on my phone so that we could talk more privately. So essentially what you need to know from these conversations between Letitia and Nicole, who's pretending not to be Nicole, is that Letitia told her basically the same story she told Alan the police about a man breaking into the house and assaulting her before making off with Gannon. And Letitia told Nicole that she needed a witness for the police to believe her story. She needed this. She needed basically her story to be corroborated by a third party so that she could help Gannon, right? <laughs> in one of these text messages, Letitia sent Nicole uh, the picture of Gannon in his bed with his blankets, and she said, quote, what if you just said you remembered something suspicious seeing this picture and explained the description and you didn't think it was relevant until now because the kid had the same cover? I swear to you, I didn't do this. I just need help with someone getting this out there so they can start posting in other states, end quote. So what Letitia's saying here is, hey, can you say that you saw a kid with the same blanket getting like pushed into a car with a man and you didn't think to tell anybody about it before you saw this picture of Gannon but now you recognize the blanket that Gannon had is the same blanket as this kid had so now you're putting two and two together and the only reason Letitia wants Nicole to you know tell the police that she saw this is because they are looking in the wrong place, the police. They are suspecting her and they're focused on her. And instead of, you know, being out there looking for Gannon, they're looking at her. And she feels like if she could just get the heat off of her and she could just put law enforcement on the right track, you know, they would start looking in other places and the word would get outside of Colorado. You know, it would get outside of, of the small community that they lived in. And that's crazy because Letitia knew that Gannon's disappearance by then had already spread far and wide. And she knew that mostly everybody around the country knew about Gannon and was suspicious of her, right? Because this case had already gone nationwide. Everyone knew that she was bad news bears by then. Letitia literally said, quote, I need a witness that the guy left. I'm not asking you. I'm asking if you know anyone who will. I'll give them my life, a reward, whatever, anything to get them to expand the search, end quote. Once again, we have to lie about seeing Gannon being taken by some guy because then that will help the police expand the search. Then they'll finally believe that he was kidnapped and they'll start looking for a kidnapped boy, right? But isn't that what the guilty person who had hurt Gannon would say? Isn't that what the guilty person who had, you know, been responsible for him disappearing? Wouldn't that be what that, that guilty person wanted? You know, does she not realize how bad she looks doing this? But at this point, she's desperate. 
I think she's completely desperate at this point. Uh, listen to some of the things that Nicole and Letitia talked about together. Okay, so Letitia's talking about this guy, you know, the guy that was in the house. And she says to Nicole, I'm beginning to think that the guy was still in the home when the police came. Either way, he popped back up with Gannon, so I assume they were in the storage room. He threatened me, so I put the girls upstairs to protect them. Because, yeah, the guy who's in the basement with Gannon threatening you is going to let you leave to go to upstairs and, you know, let Lena in and, and put the girls upstairs and make sure that they're all settled before you come back down to be held captive again. So Letitia keeps saying to Nicole, like, I know that he left with Gannon and the suitcase. I saw them leave. Somebody must have seen him leave, right? Even though there's ring doorbell footage of everything else happening. There's ring doorbell footage of Letitia and Gannon going to Petco. There's ring doorbell footage of Harley showing up. There's ring doorbell footage of Lena outside playing on her bike. There's no ring doorbell footage of this guy escaping with Gannon, but somebody must have seen it. So um, Nicole Mobley pretends to be on Letitia's side, she says, well, do you think Landon sent this guy? You know, is is this a, a Landon thing? And Letitia said um, she could have, and then things went wrong. Nicole Mobley says to Letitia, quote, do you think the detectives believe you but have to act the way they are so this guy doesn't know they're onto him? And Letitia responds, quote, not sure. I think they just don't have anything on ring camera. Someone had to see him leave. And then she starts telling Nicole, like, I would reward somebody. Basically, I would pay somebody any amount. I would do whatever it took if they could come forward and say that they saw Gannon leaving with this guy because the police really need to start looking for this guy. So they have to believe that this guy's out there. Nicole Mobley says to Letitia at some point, like, oh, I feel so bad for Gannon. I hope he's not being tortured. And Letitia says, you know, they think I killed him. If I killed him he would be more close by. And Nicole, during the trial, testified, like, when Letitia said this in in the text message, it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody mention that Gannon could be dead. I, it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody mention that Gannon could have been murdered. You know, we thought he was kidnapped. We thought he was with somebody. Like, that was the whole thing that was going on. And that's why she had said, I hope he's not being tortured. But then Letitia comes in and, like, well, if I killed him, he wouldn't, you know, he would be close by. Like, who says that? And there's a lot of talk between Nicole Mobley and Letitia about the ineptitude of law enforcement. You know, Nicole playing into Letitia, she's like, what is wrong with the police? Like, they're looking all in the wrong places. And Letitia's like, oh, trust. Trust, girl. <laughs> trust, queen. When this is all over, I'm going to have a hell of a lawsuit on my hands. And everybody's going to have to apologize to me. And everybody's going to have to tell me they're sorry. Because once again, that's all she cares about. She's going to have a lawsuit on her hands. So Nicole asks, what's this guy look like? What's, what's the description of him, the guy who took Gannon? And Letitia says Hispanic, 5'7 or 5'8, about 175 pounds. She says he's got a tattoo or something on his face, maybe a teardrop. Um, he had on a jacket. I don't remember the color, but Gannon had left with him in that cover, that bed cover. And so that's what stuck out to you when you saw it online. So what uh, Letitia's doing here is building Nicole's story for her. Like, Gannon left with that blanket, and then when you saw the picture of Gannon in the blanket that I took on that morning, that's what triggered it in your head, right? And um, Nicole Mobley says, listen, I wish I could remember this night better. Like, I wish I could remember a person or a car in front of your house or something. And Letitia says, at this point, I just need the main info out there. I only ask because it's our child. They're looking in all the wrong places. It's driving me crazy. Most people want to always help, but I know this is tricky. If it's money or whatever, name it. I want them searching the right way. She's offering to pay somebody for a false statement to the police. She's offering to pay money for somebody to go to the police and report false information, which is a crime. She's offering to pay somebody to commit a crime. And I mean, obviously, by this point, Nicole's already brought her phone to the police. Um, actually, I think it was just two days after these these conversations started that Nicole was basically in touch with the police, letting them know what Letitia was saying. So I think that's great, honestly. I think that that's probably a big reason of why the police continued to pursue Letitia, because they had somebody on the inside. And I'm very, very happy that Nicole decided to do this. But that's basically where we're going to leave off right now, because um, next time we are going to hear from the Emmy who did Gannon's autopsy, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to hear what Harley Hunt said, right? We're going to hear Letitia's own daughter's testimony, what she claims happened on that night or during the time when she was with Letitia when Letitia was disposing of Gannon's body in Pensacola, Florida. And so that is going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting video. So remember to stay tuned for that. 
Thank you so much for being here with me. Let me know in the comments what you think about this, what you think about the trial, what you think about the eventual results of the trial, what stuck out to you the most about these two days of the trial, what really kind of stuck with you the most. Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to hit like if you liked it. Don't forget to share if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. I got blood, blood on the strings